Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voices of Their Time series. A look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. I'm Bob Bullen of Middle Tennessee State University, along with my guest, Mr. Education of Rutherford County, Baxter Hobgood, for 30 years superintendent of Murfreesboro City Schools. In part one, we talked about Mr. Hopgood's early life coming to Middle Tennessee, which was then known as uh, State Teachers College, and his adventures as a student. In part two, we'll pick up uh, talking about some of his recollections with teachers and students and, and some of the sports events that he remembers as a student at, at uh, State Teachers College. Mr. Hobgood, uh, we mentioned one favorite teacher in part one. Can you remember a couple of other teachers that made an impression on you? Yes, I can think of a number who made uh, strong impressions upon me. I would very much like to mention the lady for whom the Dramatic Club is named, Miss Buchanan. She was the daughter of the only governor that Rutherford County has ever elected and was an outstanding teacher. I enjoyed my work with her. She taught uh, English and speech. I took all of her speech classes and had the tremendous pleasure of being a student assistant in one or two of the dramatic productions that she put on in my uh, last two years here at uh, State Teachers College. Then in addition to Miss Buchanan, I have to think of such people as oh, Miss Ordway, uh, also in the English department, uh, Dr. Sims in political science. Uh, I later had the privilege of writing one chapter of his book uh, on Rutherford County history, which you probably have seen. Did those teachers establish a good rapport with students or were they somewhat aloof and distant? Beg your pardon? Did they establish a good relationship with students or did they maintain a certain distance from students? I think the relationship between teacher and student was far more pronounced in those days than uh, today. Uh, there was a feeling of uh, warning uh, on the part of the teacher of warning a student above everything to succeed in his work, to do good work. And there was a personal interest on the part of every teacher that I can remember. So that was a motivating factor for many students, right. that personal there's, interest. There's in no contact. doubt about it. Dr. Sims who was a favorite of the community outstanding in uh, the civic clubs, particularly the Kiwanis Club. He belonged to the club that I joined. Um, Dr. Morris in the history department who enjoyed uh, putting questions on the board that uh, befuddled you. you. You didn't know what in the world to write. I recall once when he had written six questions on the board that not a single student had started work on the answers to the first question. But the thing to do was to pick some point in those befuddling questions, some word maybe, and take off and write, divide your time and write as fast as you could to get as much uh, information before him. 
as possible. He thought you had done a good job. You got a good grade. Do you think you got a good education here at that time? Oh, I got a better education than I deserved, I think, uh, from the standpoint of what I was doing. I did not uh, uh, make high grades. Uh, I did not enter into uh, the field of mathematics or science to any great degree. And uh, I think in the last year of my work, I must have found myself doing so many things uh, relative to the school that uh, I wonder in a way how I ever got through the school year. Well, I got through with fairly decent grades uh, because I stayed in my areas of interest. Most students were preparing to be teachers, is that correct? I don't know that I'd ever thought of being a teacher when I finished. But it, it just happened that uh, uh, during the time that I was here that uh, Mr. Mitchell had been out to judge debates, take other interests and activities on the campus. And uh, I had not uh, uh, found any place that uh, was offering anything other than teaching. I had three offers to teach, and only one of them really wanted me to teach, I think. One for baseball and one for something else. But um, one afternoon I came back to campus and Mr. Lyon was in the hallway and said, uh, Mitchell wants to see you. And I said, Mitchell? He <laughs> said, yeah, John Charlie Mitchell, Sup Superintendent of Mercerbury City School. So I went in and talked to Mr. Mitchell, and on the spot, he offered me a teaching job. And on the spot, I accepted the teaching job. And that was a and crucial moment for you because that's what kept you in Murfreesboro the rest of your life. That's right. That From that moment on, I was fixed in Murfreesboro. Well, before you, we get you to work, uh, we need to reflect on a few sports figures and events since you were a uh, closely associated with these people and would like to recall their contributions. The school had a good girls basketball team along around 26 or 27, and they were invited to a, a special tournament in yes, Moines, often, Iowa. Oftentimes you hear it stated out here that no national championship has ever been won. I question that a little bit. Now, I think I suggested to you once that the search, research department do a little work on it. If I'm not mistaken, 1927-28, uh, State Teachers College girls basketball team was invited to Des Moines, Iowa because it had been decided in Tennessee that as far as colleges and universities were, were concerned, the team here was the best team in Tennessee. That's the only way they played tournaments in those days. They didn't have the uh, classifications that you have today. And our team went to Des Moines, and if I'm not mistaken, they won the national championship. It, it could be that they came in second. But as I recall, they won the championship. Who was the star player on that team? The star player offensively particularly was Dean Beasley's sister, Mary Beasley. Had the uncanny ability to stop on a dime and turn the ball loose and hit the bottom of the net. Who else and on that team do you remember? Emma D. Dillon. Uh, as a defensive player who is presently located in a place I believe they call Burbonnet 
Texas. Uh, she went out there soon after. She finished her college career, and uh, some fellow had got tired of operating his big ranch. So she's still alive, you think? Oh, she's still alive. They heard from her uh, over in the uh, alumni center this week, last week. Well, they, uh, she went down to this place, and this gentleman was tired of operating this tremendous ranch. And he met MID. He wanted to move away from it completely. He met uh, Miss Dillon and uh, offered her the job of managing this ranch. <laughs> and she, I don't know whether she'd ever seen a cow or not. Uh, but at any rate, she accepted. And as far as I know, she's there right now. But this, um, the answer she sent to uh, Ms. Kirk was that uh, she could not attend the meeting this weekend, but uh, she sent her regards. And her main problem in not being able to attend sent it around the injuries she had received in her early days and she found it difficult to travel. Let's quickly go through sports and mention some that you would like to identify football. Let me, yeah, football. Let me mention hurriedly uh, one of the best broken field runners I've ever seen, Henry Hackman, who was the father of uh, our Dr. Hackman here in Murfreesboro, and his wife, uh, Miss Bledsoe. Then there was uh, John Dixon, a friend of mine, lifetime again, uh, deceased now. Um, Hubert Swan, who died a couple of months ago, those old timers going along, Hubert, Dr. Hubert Swan, he taught here at the university some, and got his doctors from Columbia, lived over on Greenville. He was buried about a couple of months ago. Dan McGugan called him one of the best centers he'd ever seen in his life. For those who are not familiar with Dan McGugan, he was the coach at Vanderbilt. Back. I just wanted to identify Dan McGugan as the coach at Vanderbilt. Isn't that correct? Doctor, yeah, yeah. Doctor, uh, um, Dan McGugan was a coach at Vanderbilt. What about... Uh, Baseball. Baseball, the outstanding player I would have to name, uh, uh, Cola Shaw. Cola uh, pitched here in his college days. Then he went to Memphis to pitch for the old Memphis Chicks. It was in the Southern League. In the Southern League. And Doc Prothero uh, became manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, who incidentally be playing Atlanta tonight. Uh, he took Cola with him to Pittsburgh, and Cola became uh, an outstanding pitcher in the major leagues. I believe he stayed with uh, the Pittsburgh organization for six years. And uh, not too long after leaving, he died. I'd forgotten the circumstances of his death. But so he, he was the outstanding star in, in baseball. Anybody else in baseball you want to mention? Well, uh, I, I don't recall anyone that went into professional okay. baseball. There were some real good players. What like, about basketball? Did we have any uh, good men? Basketball, basketball a while players? ago I mentioned uh, uh, Elmo Malone, it's called Molly, good freshman class that year, and Claude Vickers, 
both came from the same school, Dowtown, and Ms. Vickers will be on campus this week to visit with old timers. Uh, these, as I recall, were the two that stood out in my memory. There were others uh, who played very successfully. But so, that was an outstanding fresh class that year. So coming to school in Murfreesboro uh, led to three things for you. One, you made some lifetime friends. Uh, two, it led to a job. And three, it eventually led to meeting your wife. So let's talk about uh, meeting your wife. Uh, when did uh, that first happen? And let's have a little background. Talk about, about my wife. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about your wife. <laughs> well, she was not at Central High School in my first year. But uh, she came in the second year. And uh, you had a combination job. Let's get that straight for our viewers. You had a combination job between McFadden and the high school. In the first year. In the first year. In the first year, I worked at uh, the high school two periods in the morning. And then uh, went over to McFadden School, 1930 to serve as principal of uh, that school. They told me primarily because the teacher, the lady who had been principal, didn't like to whip children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't think I would like it either. And when I got over there, I determined that the main need at McFadden was for the girls and boys to have something to do. And though we had very little in equipment, uh, I got a football somewhere and got down in the dirt with them and uh, played a little football, organized a community baseball team, played on it myself. <laughs> and uh, somewhere or another, we played a little basketball, although there was no gym that that time, they didn't get the gym at McFadden until the school was reconstructed in 1934. Uh, and incidentally, some of the historic publications uh, in Murfreesboro list 1934 as the beginning year for McFadden, but this is not true because I was there in 1930. It was rebuilt in 1934. So you met Mrs. Hobgood uh, during your second year at Central? I met her through the secondary work year at, uh, in my second year. As I say, she was not there during that first year. She was teaching in Clarksville. Yeah, she was a graduate of a, of a woman's uh, college here that's located over where Central Middle School is located. Now, what was the name of that school where your wife went to college? Central Middle School. Woman's... Uh, Tennessee College. Yeah, Tennessee, Tennessee College for Women. That, Tennessee College yeah. for Women. Well, she, she uh, received some very uh, strict training there, I understand, and uh, they had high standards for those young ladies. Oh, yeah. The uh, Tennessee College for Women was... Uh, Baptist school, and uh, they had uh, some students who became outstanding in their work. They were very, very strict. I don't know whether you're trying to get me to get around and tell the story of uh, how there was a man who lived right across the street. Yeah, I want you to tell that story about they had to walk to town and pass, yeah. had to wear gloves. Uh, give me a little background on that. There was a man who lived right across the street from uh, Tennessee College who made that pictures and had other associations with the leaders of the college. His name was Lively. But the Tennessee College girls had been instructed that they were never, ever to accept a ride to town or from town with anyone. They could not go alone. There had to be at least two uh, going at the same time, 
more if possible. Uh, they could not accept a ride with anyone. But one day, Mr. Lively is going to town and uh, he sees some of the, a couple of the girls walking toward town and he drives up beside them and offers them a ride. No, I'm sorry, we can't ride, they responded. Again, he offered, no, we can't ride. And he said, oh, come on, it's all right. Uh, I'm lively. And one of the girls said, well, we are too, but we still can't ride. <laughs> I like that story. Uh, now, was, tell me uh, what captured your fancy uh, about your wife. You, you got married shortly thereafter, I think, so she must have uh, uh, well, we married captured your imagination. We married in 1933. I, I uh, have always insisted in, and told her that during my uh, first year there with her in 1932, she didn't pay a bit of attention to me. But uh, one day, uh, Mr. Mitchell asked me to make a talk in uh, chapel. And somehow or another, I pronounced some words in Latin correctly. And uh, her opinion about me started to change all of a sudden. <laughs> and I was able to get a date with it. And from that point on, things moved pretty swiftly. In 1933, we were married. Well, that's a good story about you getting married uh, and, and uh, the preacher that came to town and married you had an interesting background. So let's talk about that event. Yes. Uh, this was Dr. Carter Helm Jones. And uh, colorful, interesting preacher. 1930. Uh, and, and this was before I had met my wife, uh, he retired from uh, the First Baptist Church in Seattle and was, he was in uh, not what was known as the Southern Baptist Association, but the American Baptist Association. And he left Seattle was on his way to his beloved Virginia, uh, somewhere close to Lynchburg, and found himself in James K. Polk Hotel here in Murfreesboro on his trip. And uh, it happened that during the week, almost, uh, the First Baptist Church here had lost its pastor, a fellow by the name of Dr. McConnell, who was very much interested in baseball. And when an offer came for him to accept a church in Florida, close to the baseball training grounds, where they train every spring, he accepted it almost overnight. We'd been very fond of uh, Dr. McConnell because uh, he liked to come out here and put on a mask, and breast protector, and chin guards, and, and join the varsity or any pickup team that was organized to scrimmage the varsity. He liked to join them, and we liked him and went to the Baptist church to hear him. But on this Sunday, when four or five hours went, he wasn't there. And this man uh, walks out uh, with his uh, long tail coat and uh, gray pants. And one of us looked at the other and <laughs> said, uh, oh, one of those. <laughs> But uh, as this man preached, we began to change our tune because the sermon he preached was tremendous. It was just something. 
the upshot of it was that, as I understood later, that the deacons of the church got together right after the sermon, met him and said, please stay with us. And they said, well, maybe we can get our furniture stopped. It's on the way to Lynchburg. But they got it changed. And he spent six years here. Now, he had an interesting connection with the past since he was an elderly gentleman. He, he could trace his youth back to the Civil War. So tell me that little story. He was about. old when he came here. And uh, at the close of the Civil War in his home state of Virginia, he, as a lad of about six years, had had the privilege of riding with Robert E. Lee on travel. He never forgot it. And uh, Lee was uh, his favorite of all people. And this event stood out. And there's a story told on page 44 of a biography written by head of the history department at Moorhead, Kentucky, page 44, that lists the story of how uh, this Carter Helm Jones saw Robert E. Lee sitting on the stage in his first year after leaving the war with his legs crossed. And Carter Ham Jones runs up to the stage and sets himself down between <laughs> the legs of Robert E. Lee. And when time came for uh, Robert E. Lee to pass out the degrees for the students there at Washington University, which was to become, as you know, Washington, Washington and Lee. Lee. Uh, he wouldn't even let them wake the boy up. He didn't get up to pass out the degree <laughs> and wouldn't let them wake the boy up. He uh, sat, they made someone hand him the degrees and had the graduates marked by him and the boy. And he'd hand them their degrees as they went by and shook hands with him. And uh, he loved to tell the story of his associations with Robert E. Lee. And he was back to on his way to Virginia to be somewhere near uh, Appomattox and uh, General Lee headquarters. Well, that's an interesting story in connection with history. Uh, let's talk about another uh, event in your life. Tell me about actually getting married, and that was an interesting well, story. You seem to always have things happen to you that are very close to the campus. <laughs> oh, I've always been on this campus. The, uh, for some reason, it uh, was established that uh, July the 5th, 1933, would be the uh, most convenient time for us to have our marriage. Uh, an uncle had, of my wife had expressed a desire to see the wedding. He was sick. He couldn't leave his room at his home. And he'd expressed a desire to see the wedding. So all of us talking with uh, her uncle's wife and the uncle, my uh, wife's mother and others, my best man, Dr. Carter Hill, and Dr. Carter Helm Jones, we all found, all found that it would be convenient to meet July the 5th and have the ceremony on that date. 
So Dr. Carter Helm Jones came out and performed the ceremony in the presence of this uncle of my wife's. And uh, we took off from there on our honeymoon trip. But uh, we had more good years with uh, Dr. Carter Helm, three more, and um, enjoyed our association with him. You spent your honeymoon in, in Warren County at the Sudbury Inn, is that right? Beg your pardon? You spent your honeymoon in McMinnville, I believe, at the Sudbury Inn? No, we went by McMinnville to have uh, something to eat. And uh, we stopped at uh, the famous Sudbury Inn, where, where many people went in those days for something to eat. I guess we ate a fairly good meal, <laughs> I don't recall. That's exactly what went on then, too. Asheville and spent a little while, went by the famous Biltmore house and uh, on uh, to my hometown for a while, then to visit with a cousin in um, Newport News, Virginia. They, wanted us to spend some time with him. So that was really a good honeymoon trip That was you had. pretty fair honeymoon, all in all. Well, when you got back to work, you had to face the reality of dealing with children every day. Give me some description of what life was like uh, teaching in Murfreesboro in the 1930s. What, what were those days like? In 1934 on for the rest of uh, my period of teaching in the old Central High School, uh, building. Uh, I learned, first of all, one of the reasons why Mr. Mitchell had wanted me to uh, come to his program. He had, uh, he had known that he was going to lose. Uh, one of his top men, that was a Mr. Bruner, Doc, Mr. Bruner, who became head of the history department at TPI um, soon after I started work at Central High School. And in addition to being the history teacher at Central High School, Mr. Bruner had coached the debate team. And I was given that job. Soon after that period, uh, the uh, job of coaching girls basketball team fell on my shoulders and I had a number of activities uh, in addition to teaching uh, history. Uh, <coughs> I enjoyed the teaching of the history. I don't know just how well I taught it and sometimes I guess I taught it under circumstances that were uh, different from um, uh, the way other people proceeded. I, I recall one year, instead of opening the textbook and starting at uh, what would be a chronological order of American history, we went back and picked up the Constitution and started with the Bill of Rights and tried to spread American history at both ends then, early American history and later American history, with the Bill of Rights <clears throat> as a Senate. And, of course, our interpretation of the Bill of Rights was much different from some interpretations you're getting today. But you were a coach who was serious about what went on in the classroom. Yes, I, I thought... Uh, what you did in the classroom came first. And there may have been times when I didn't do much. Uh, I, I, was, I was doing so much that uh, I wondered uh, oftentimes if I were really uh, concentrating enough on the actual classroom teaching, 
and I guess sometimes in self-defense, uh, got the students doing more things than I was doing. Uh, maybe I profited a little from that because I recall one incident in which near the end of school, I asked all the students who would to bring anything in from home that they had that reminded them of uh, American history, early, late, whatever it happened to be. And near the close of school, I'd ask them to pick those things up. Well, one year, uh, a document was left, and uh, I could not possibly find the owner. Looked, looked, and looked. It turned out that, that uh, whoever it was had left a copy of the Ulster County Gazette. The Ulster County Gazette was printed in Baltimore and announced the death, the funeral arrangement, the funeral procession of George Washington. I was told later that it was possible that that document was one of four that were known to be somewhere in the United States. What happened to that document? That document is in the history room at Cannonsburg Village. A good place. A good right place. now, and I have a little note on it that it is on loan from me. And incidentally, a man came by from up uh, somewhere in a Midwestern state, apparently a history buff, and talked to Fred, the caretaker, uh, out at Cannonsburg, the, and the history room was not open at the time. But this man wanted to see the history room, the area where Dr. Homer Pittard had fixed up a uh, scene of uh, the battlefield and the other things that were in the room. He went in and saw Dr. Pittard's display and started looking around the room and came upon this uh, newspaper that's in a case there. And uh, he turned to Fred and said, who is this Hobgood guy? <laughs> and uh, Fred told him. He said, well, I wish I had time to see him, but you see him and tell him that when he takes this document out of here, be very, very careful the way he hums it because I'm almost certain that it's one of the four original documents that are known to be somewhere in the United States at the present time. And he based his, Fred said he based his conclusion on the fact that uh, he had observed that the part of the S's, alphabet S, were pictured almost like they were an F. And he said, this is enough proof for me. I'm almost convinced that this is one of four of those documents. Well, hopefully the community will realize what they have. You had a reputation as being calm, cool-headed as a coach, you're rarely losing your temper, but there was a game uh, with Buchanan that, was, that ended in such an outrageous manner that you did lose your temper in that one. Could you recall that one? This had to do with uh, your yes, times we, as a girls' basketball coach. We laugh about that sometimes uh, now. Uh, this was a year after the girl... Uh, who played out at Buck Hannon, uh had uh, beaten everybody. And as Aline Banks paid, and 
to this day, I happen to think she was the best girl basketball player ever produced in the United States. I, I just think she stands out as the number one girl basketball player of all time. She went on and played for the business school in Nashville and played against the Russians, is that correct? She, she played against the international girls team from Russia and played in the, not the Murphy gym, but the one. The, the alumni gym. The alumni gym here on campus. The Russian girls team got in that night and they had uh, failed to shave under their arms. <laughs> failed to <laughs> shave. And they were six, six and a half feet. <laughs> All except one of them. And one of them was a beautiful blonde who was a good basketball player. And she and Eileen scored about the same number of points that night. Eileen scored about 34, and this Russian girl scored about 34. Uh, but, of course, those big uh, girls could reach up defensively and just take the ball off and throw it down the court. This was about 49 or 50, somewhere along there, wasn't yeah. it? And there was some question in your mind if those Russian women were really women. Well, I, I don't want to say, but uh, this game caused the International Committee, uh, whatever they were called in that day and time, to issue orders that uh, from that point on, any... Uh, girls team uh, coming from Russia would into the United States would be required to take medical tests of some kind to determine their sex. Well, I'm not going to let you get away from that Buckhannon game where you lost your temper at the end yeah. of the game, so. Yes. Um, this game uh, came the next year and uh, the this was a year after the, the yeah. young lady you referred to had graduated. Yeah. Uh, lady named Miss Farrah and I often laugh at it because she was a culprit in the long run. <laughs> but the official uh, blew his whistle at the end of the game. We were leading by one point. He immediately called a foul on uh, Pauline Blankenship. She is now Pauline Wilson at that time. Called her for something that in those days was known as face guarding, which meant that the uh, guard got right down in front of the offensive player and looked in the eye and uh, who do to us something of the sort? I never did understand the regulation. But at any rate, he, when they called the foul on this girl, she was back under the goal. And the girl with the ball was up near the dividing line. And I couldn't understand to save my life how she could be face guarding. Since in face guarding, you had to be directly in front of the player who was handling the ball offensively. And call that foul and it carried two shots. And the girl who was now Miss Farrow went to the foul line and uh, sank two of them just as beautiful <laughs> as they could be. And uh, well, my wife had often said that uh, people used to say uh, that uh, they had to watch me because I never lost my temper or never even stood up during a game, just sat there very quietly. Uh, on this occasion, I was leaving the gym and I just happened to make remark 
uh, uh, rather viciously, I'm afraid. <clears throat> well, they say I don't ever uh, make a complaint, but by George, and I don't know what I said beyond that, <laughs> I'm going to confront him this time. I'm tired of this. I'm not going to let him get by with it. Well, Coach Red Floyd was sitting right by the door uh, doing his whittling. And as I started out the door, he just simply reached over and grabbed my, my arm. He said, oh, no, Hop, you're not going to do that. He said, uh, you're going to have times like this in your life, said, I've had a lot of them, and said, uh, you're not going to let your girl see you like you are now. said, come on over here and sit down <laughs> and uh, get yourself calm like you always are. I, I, don't, I have no idea why Coach Floyd came to our girls' basketball game. Well, for our viewers, <laughs> Coach Floyd was the legend at MTSC oh, yeah. back at that time. Yeah. Of course, he, he was here when uh, Bubba Murphy was playing and running all over opposition. Now, you were a successful basketball coach. I believe you won four out of five championships in one <coughs> run, and that was an interesting conference that you played in. I believe they called it the Little Ten. Yes. Uh, we could win the Little Ten conference when we could not beat the other team sometime when we got into larger areas. Uh, we'd often lose, whereas we could win the Little Ten Conference without too much difficulty. This was in spite of the fact we had no gym, never practiced on a home floor, and never played a game. You played your games at the campus school? At the campus school. And we, had, we practiced in a little place in the old Central High School building that had been intended for a swimming pool. Uh, and of course, timing was always off during the first half of a game. But um, if we ever did anything, it was in second half. But in four out of the five years that I coached, somehow or another, we managed to win four championships and one co-championship uh, during those years. These were schools like Columbia, Franklin, Gallatin, Lewisburg, uh, Dixon, um, schools like that, that Peabody Demonstration School. Um, they were the schools that made up the Little Ten. And incidentally, I had competition in more things than uh, athletics. They competed in speech work, dramatic work, things of that nature. Mr. Hobgood, we have about 10 minutes left in this second part, so I would like to make sure that we get in the, the uh, section about the great debate team you had along about 1939 and mention a couple of names, and you took that debate group to a national tournament in Beverly Hills, I believe. Could you relate that story for our listeners? Yes, we always emphasized debate in uh, high school in those days as members of the national Forensic League. Uh, we uh, enjoyed it. Uh, often won the state championship. And in 1939, we won the state championship. And uh, since the program came late in the year and was scheduled for Beverly Hills, California, they decided to have the contest about a month after schools close in Beverly Hill. And uh, we took three people out there, my wife and I, B.B. Uh, Carr, I believe he's a neighbor of yours. All right, lives right behind him, fine neighbor. 
John D. Wiseman and uh, Lepa Freeman for extemporaneous speaking, I believe it was. You had 64 teams in that tournament, I think, and you finished 18th or 19th. There were 64 almost a... teams in the tournament. We like two points making the final round of 16. In other words, that made us the 18th team out of the 64 there. Um, this, uh, everywhere we went in those years, uh, the farther west we could get, the better we would do. If we went east, we ran against teams that uh, were too experienced, uh, who had uh, budgets and uh, experience that would amaze you. And in addition to that, the judges uh, complained about accent <laughs> uh, for Southern folks. Why is it we don't have debating today like like they did in another era? I what don't happened? know. I'm sure the National Forensic League is still operating in some form, but I never hear anything about uh, debate participation. Uh, the old-time uh, debating activities. I, I think one reason for that has been the fact that somebody way back yonder told people to always talk in a conversational tone. And uh, the old-time art began to disappear. I might say that uh, Governor Clement grew up in this National Forensic League type of conversation. His aunt, Mrs. Weems, over Dixon, is one of the important figures at the national level. And she, she helped uh, Governor Clement in so many ways, and I've often wished that they had let her write the speech that he made at the National Convention when he ruined himself. Uh, that speech uh, didn't go over well, did it? Yeah, Something about how long, oh, how long, oh, I remember. Long, oh, Lord, how long, oh, <laughs> I remember. Ruined him. And uh, if she had seen it uh, before he went up there, she would have Straightened him torn out. it up. Let me ask you before we close out, what do you remember about that trip to Hollywood or, or Beverly Hills? Did you get to see much of California and you, and you probably had to drive oh, yeah. across well, country? We, we remember so many things. Uh, the prices were so low compared to the, for one dollar you could go places and eat a sumptuous meal, not hot dog and uh, uh, hamburgers, but meals served in special courses. One dollar each, all you wanted to eat, and some to take home with you if you wanted. Now, of course, we went by several places of historic interest. Uh, Grand Canyon, uh, uh, Treasure Island, uh, several other places. So it was really a grand adventure for all of you. Enjoyed it very much. I, wa I wanted to say something uh, about people here at the university okay. who in later times have assisted us so much in our program and is a further indication of uh, the cooperation between community and, uh, and the university. I, I think back to the student teacher program uh, that was of so much help to us. It got many teachers out of this program. And uh, people like uh, uh, Dr. White, uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Pocott, Dr. Mary Tom Berry, who lives here now. I guess all of those people live here, don't they? Well, one of them's yeah. passed away, Dr. Pocott they passed, passed away. away. We'll get a chance to talk about that some more. If you'll agree to another hour later on, we'll get into the, your career as a superintendent. We've only gotten you up to about World War 
too. So I think we have just time to uh, comment. Where were you on uh, Pearl Harbor Day? You remember that? Pearl Harbor Day. I was uh, that was on Sunday, wasn't it? Yes, sir. December seventh. I was at home. Uh, and I remember the story that came uh, to us over radio so vividly. And uh, one area that I had hoped to at least mention, and maybe we can, as you say, some other time, and that was uh, the tremendous program that going to be recognized uh, uh, the 17th, I believe it is, at uh, Miller Lanier celebration. He was connected with the Aviation Cadet Program. Yes, sir, we'll get to that. I believe we'll, if you'll agree to another hour later on, we'll get to that. But I, I want you to remember the impact on Murfreesboro with the start of World War II, and, and how did the students at the high school react to the start of the war? Do you, do you recall that, how they reacted? Uh, at the start? Yes, sir, the I'll announcement of the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor. What, what was the reaction at the high school? I, I don't remember that there was any great change in the attitude of the uh, students uh, at that particular time. Of course, as it went on, there were changes, and it developed to a point where uh, you simply had, uh, you didn't even have men teachers in your program. When I became superintendent, one man, under some pretty difficult periods, and he was a retired teacher from here at the university. So you had a lot of your uh, students when they graduated, they wanted to enlist and go straight on into the military. Quite a number of them did. When they graduated, they made no other plans. But many of them, they just simply, to the extent that they could, uh, got into the one area of service or another. Well, what we'll do is we'll pick up in the concluding part later on. We'll talk about your involvement with the aviation program here and then your years as superintendent. This concludes part two of our discussion with Baxter Hobgood, retired superintendent of Murfreesboro City Schools. Thank you for tuning in.